Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to this special event. Poems from Connecticut's Four Corners, which has been started by our poet laureate emerita, Barb Jenis. Barb has a new book coming out, I hear. Um, so keep your eyes open for that event. Um, welcome, Barb. Introduce our poets, please. I will. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Ridgefield Library. Always, you're such a welcoming home to poets and their poems. Um, and this ongoing series now entering our second year. So it's great to have everyone here with us tonight. Um, I just want to do a couple of quick promotions for things that are coming up. Do my share screen. Um, first of all, in just a couple of weeks, April 19th, um, we have state adult poet laureate Antoinette Brimbell and also the 2023-24 20, youth poet laureate um, Mercury Lamb, who will be doing a reading. Um, I'll, I will put the bit.ly link in the chat so you, if you'd like to register and if you do if you register you'll of course get a reminder later on too and then next month uh for the may um poems from connecticut's four corners we have five brand new state poet or you know poet laureates from around the state um from Scotland, Enfield, Manchester, Thompson, and Brantford. And we've, we've been hatching a nice crop of new poets laureate this year. So I'm sure we'll do another one of these readings a little bit later in the year. So please, and again, I'll put that, um, that link in the chat as well. So then let me stop that share. Um, and that's it. Um, please, as I mentioned uh, before we started recording, please feel free to put um, comments in the chat. Uh, as a poet is reading. They love to see what you have to say about their work. Um, and we'd like to see if, and also if you have questions, we can uh, get to them at the end of the end of the reading. So um, this Poems from Connecticut's Four Corners is really meant kind of as a sampler of Connecticut poets. Each poet has anywhere, you know, 12 to 15 minutes, somewhere in that window to read. So you don't get a lot of their work, but it's nice because you get some of their work, you get a sampling of it. And you can see the, the amazing diversity of, of poets from around the state. So it's always, always um, a lot of fun to see that, see that diversity. So without further ado, um, I'm going to first introduce Elaine Nadal, um, who is the author of two poetry chapbooks, When and Sweat, Dance, Sing, Cut, uh, from Finishing Line Press. Um, her work is widely published. Nadal um, delivered a TEDx talk, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. You should definitely Google that on hope, poetry, and music. So um, I'm going to put her full length a biography in the chat, but please welcome Elaine. Elaine, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to start with two poems that I'm going to read back to back. They go together. The first one's Blue Bridge and the second one is Daughter. So I'm just going to go straight to Daughter after I read Blue Bridge. If you understood, you know that my song isn't about cherubs, cherry blossoms, or a charming prince. Is an empty rocking chair, a wind chime, a chromatic harmony, a holler, a wrinkled shadow, a distant heart, a familiar stranger with calluses on his feet, a wanderer eating rice with bare hands, blue notes to wash the soil, blue notes to gather the soil, blue notes to part the sea. Crossing is hard. Cross is heavy. Caterpillar can't swim. Horse can't fly. Blue notes to wash the soil. Blue notes to gather the soil. Blue notes to part the sea. In my dream, I was a doll on a revolving pedestal. A doll with long black hair wearing a white dress that sparkled like father's cold blue eyes. He taught us how to see the world, a space of suffering with few pockets of joy, with people who love you for a moment and then discard you after you fulfilled a purpose. In my dream, people loved me. I was beautiful. My smile was a sunrise reflecting only what I wanted to show. Father was good. He worked overtime. Father was bad. He beat us with belt buckles and pulled our hair. Father was good. 
He beat us because he wanted to protect us. But mother, mother told on us. Mother was bad. She knew it would get him angry, but she wanted him to love her. In my dream, no one, no one saw me cry. Father hated crying. He said it shows weakness, so he got mad instead. Mother cried all the time. When father came late, when he called her ugly, when he hit her for looking at a man's chest on TV, it was all for her own good, father told us. His mama never beat him. His daddy never beat him. They gave him away. They let him go. Who notes to wash the soil? Who notes to gather the soil? Who notes to part see? I'm looking for a lullaby that can help me fall asleep. A blue light, a blue dream. In my dream, I was lonely as I am now. Standing on a rotating pedestal. Smiling before an audience. But crying when my back was turned. This next poem is called Stay Silent. It takes four generations to break a curse. Mother told sister she won't have kids because she's bad seed. Poor sister lost five, four miscarriages and one stillborn. Stay still spell bred by her giver who begat it from her maker who got it from his creator. Push, push the jinx away. Sister prayed. Mother thought her prayers were no good because they were either too soggy or too stale and missing some grit and bone and flowers ain't going to grow. She needs to pray harder. She needs to push more. But she's got a sincere heart, Mama. Push. Push the jinx away. Mother said sister's got a dirty heart and she needs to make herself good. Drink these soapy suds. Cleanse your tongue. Purify your insides. That's going to make her sick, Mama. Push. Push the jinx away. Sister pushed stillborn baby. Baby never cried. Sister often cries. Therapist told her to meditate, and she meditates in her cage for four minutes and 33 seconds. She's got the faith of a mustard seed and the hatred of a mountain. Um, this next one is one of my recent ones. It's called The Couch with the Clear Plastic Cover. <laughs> the couch with the clear plastic cover, resistant spills, squeaky and slippery at times, making the thighs stick. The one my siblings and I sat on with our nicest clothes while you shot the photo. The couch you saved several checks for. The one that made you work overtime, double shifts. It made you proud of your hard work justified you being away from home to give us nice things we couldn't ruin or be comfy in. In the center of the living room, it brought a smile to your face, strong enough to light up the space, too weak to conceal your fatigue. That couch, a rotten apple, the knot in my throat, the stone you rolled up a hill you tried to reach. That couch with its clear plastic covers confining you to sheen and appearance, to not really living, the one you cherished and protected much more than me. This next one is called Proclamation Two. I don't need you to find me pretty. Don't care if you like my hair. It doesn't concern you if my attire is too loose or too tight. Don't need you to approve of my curves. You can criticize my skin. You can judge. I've got my words. I carry life. Violence, avarice, and injustice walk among us. They divide, diminish, destroy, exchanging hope for fear. Yet feeble eyes focus on the image, the outer layer of the butterfly, neglecting the cocoon from which it came. I don't need you to find me pretty. There's enough ugly in the world. This one is called Beyond. I found the answers when the sky was layered in pink, lavender, and celestial blue. I am a medicine woman, though my breasts have never produced milk and my womb is barren. 
I'm not bad seed. My name has a face comprised of geometrical shapes and eight notes. I am whole. I delight in the taste of strawberries before I slumber. The sweetness makes up a moon and I dream of incredible things that I can make happen. Despite being worn down by distorted figures and dismissed by pale caresses, my body heals, our bodies heal on their own with the help of others, with the love from beyond. Uh, and I have two more. This one is called Music and it's about, uh, I was having a terrible time and I was in my sofa and all of a sudden I thought of a song I used to sing um, when I was a teenager and um, it was a good moment. So this is called Music. It is my love letter to music because I think that music just like poetry is therapeutic and healing, of course. <laughs> I forgot I had known you. I didn't remember your ways, your body, how it moved like a snake sometimes, or a dolphin spontaneous and playful, leaping for air. In you, oh, you are air. I had known you, the manner in which you move a heart dispirited by storms. You catch the storms and they become dissonant wonders. How did I manage to live like this with the heaviness of things? Without your sky, I wasn't looking for you. Your embrace came unexpectedly on a cold day of thunder and lightning. You saw me off key with achy dry bones sitting on my sofa with too many pillows. Your eyes finding beauty in a desert or pasture lit up the room. A song rose from slumber and I felt alive a little less lonely. I would cherish you. I will take the debris, the roots, the particles, the pockets of joy, the butterfly and the cocoon from which it came. And I will turn it all into breath, into life, into you. And the last one is one of my favorites because it's about hair. It's called Rising. My hair was free. Frizzy greñas dancing with the winds. Son, chacha, mambo, salsa. Divided into sections, each doing its thing. A chaotic consortium of exotic flavors. Jassy, raspy, sultry, gutsy, swaying, wailing, moving, grooving, dragging, shaking, stepping, pressing, improvising, synchronizing, calling, responding. Nothing could stop it. Gels, lotions, perms, rollos, strong, tenacious, bold, perseverant. It stood up everywhere because it could. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. What great rhythm on that last one. Very fun. <laughs> Thank Very you. fun. And some, all the poems were just really like, I love the line, the faith of a mustard seed and the hate of a mountain. Just really lovely and um and that couch yep we all <laughs> we all had that couch <laughs> thank you very much elaine thank you so much for reading all right next um and again uh, as i said i'm going to put the long bios in the chat be sure to check each poet's um biography to find out their publications but next up we have lewis gabordi um lou lewis is a retired educator his work has been recognized by the New Millennium Writing Awards and published in Waking Up to the Earth, Connecticut Poets in a Time of Global Climate Crisis, and elsewhere. So please welcome Louis Gabordi. Thank you, Barb, very much. And again, thank you to the Richfield Public Library. It's wonderful that you've done this and kept it going. It's a, it's a great thing. Um, I really enjoyed Elaine's reading. I, I have no odes to my hair. To, to follow up with, so uh, in case you were expecting that. Uh, my first poem is titled Waters. I am drawn to thoughts of stiller water now, a small body, perhaps an acre or so, held in cupped palms of low grass, soft and deepening to blue in the violet glow of evening. A single maple stands nearby, <clears throat> simple as a child might draw, a place to rest my back in silence and watch the gathering stars. 
I have ridden on currents all of my life, where the arid moon draws the long river and floods the fertile marsh. I have drifted through the painted reeds that lean and whistle above the mussels and the fiddler crabs. I have played among the rolls and spray of oceans and floated where the cold spring curls through stone to stir the green pond. These are the waters that run in me, that fill my cells and swell the pulsing streams beneath my skin. In me, the force that sculpts the cliff. In me, the thin wash that makes the brook stones sing. When the earth retrieves from me her water and her clay, and I come to rest beyond the flow of time, I hope to find beside me a curled silver body, content within the stillness as I am sure to be. There it goes. Um, my next poem is When I Cannot. It's the, uh, I guess it's sort of love poem that's written after being so with someone for over 40 years. <clears throat> and uh, it's dedicated to my wife, Catherine, When I Cannot. In the rose and gold of twilight, she stands beside our bed and bends to lay her palm against my cheek. I hear the voice our children knew as she'd coax a wooden splinter from an anxious hand or lower a broken sparrow into a box of grass. Her breath is cool and welcome on my brow. She threads her arms through mine and lifts to help me sit. She is sorry, she tells me twice. Sorry that the time has come again for her to bathe me. A basin waits beside the towel she spread across our floor. <clears throat> Pardon me. Breathe, she says, and moments later, breathe again, before she brings me to my feet. She steadies me until I brace myself against my walker. Is this okay, she whispers. Should I get a stool? I feel stronger when she speaks. No, I say, this will do for now. She opens my pajama top, helps me draw first one arm, then the other from the sleeves. She eases my bottoms and briefs, damp with sweat, past my ankles until my feet are free. Are you cold? She asks. No, I say, not terribly. And she begins. The cloth is warm as she cleans each feature of my face, slides it around my neck and across my hair so gently it might be sensuality on another evening. She washes my arms and hands, does each finger separately. Next, with broader strokes, my abdomen and chest, my back and ribs, then my thighs, my knees, my calves and feet. Last, my genitals and buttocks. She sets aside the cloth she moved in circles, lines and crescents, a geometry of tenderness. Looking up, she says, now you must be cold. I nod and she wraps me in my robe, warm still from the dryer, and holds me close. She presses my palm into her cheek, brings it to her lips, does not let it go, and leans until her forehead touches mine. I close my eyes and cannot say where I end, and she begins. I know we must be formed, but I feel we could be light. Uh, something a little perkier. Um, this is Rainy Day Field Guide. Another day of postponed pleasures. Rivulets of fractured light bend across the kitchen window. I reach for the paperback, always at my elbow beside the breakfast table. Eastern birds will pass a rainy hour. Peaceful and satisfying, this sense of time spent usefully with silhouettes and song before the sun comes back. On every other page, another cloudless paper sky, another gathered family, whose shapes and plumage tell me every bird belongs exactly there. How many of us know so certainly our place? Birders, more than most, perhaps, and poets, both so circumspect and patient, 
practiced in the art of listening for fragile things. When the rain abates, the colors come, ruby, gold, and sapphire, sweeping to the feeders through the gray. A cardinal gathers from the garden with her crest slicked back, slips into the thicket, and repeats until the rain resumes. I do not look away. How fully must my needs be met if I can spare concern for hatchlings I have never seen, huddled in a woven cup, waiting out of storm. And there's our easy bargain, a scoop of seeds, a well-considered berry bush or two, exchanged for daily pleasure and reflection in the beauty of a green-lit world that waits outside myself. This is a short poem, The Skeptic. I don't know what to make of moons that stay through autumn mornings. They linger like dying love, then fade into the blue of days. Persistent incongruities, these after images of night, their arc fluorescence so well charged, we long believe their surface white came not from washed reflection, but their essence. You whisper love and lean to me, and I believe it's true, but whisper twice beneath the morning moon. Um, this poem is uh, the result of working with and observing young adults, teenagers, secondary school setting for uh, nearly 40 years. Um, kids struggle in different ways, but there are certain commonalities, and this is a result of my observation of one of those on certain days. On certain days, she pulls herself through crowds of nearly pure reflection, where every back and chest and passive face is polished past its visible existence into light. And from all directions, bent and bloated, she comes at herself. Evenings, she will take a room within a house of mirrors, surrounded by the slivers of herself, a jury of her peers, if nothing else. Um, I hope you're all familiar with it, but we have a, a little gem in the southeast corner of Connecticut, the Florence Griswold Museum. Uh, beautiful place, beautiful location, wonderful programs. A few years ago, Catherine and I were there and I, um, was just fixated on one particular painting. And I stayed there for the longest time and I realized I was feeling frustrated. There was something I was not getting from it, which I really wanted to get from it. And I couldn't figure out that what that was. And when I left, I was still frustrated. It was two years later when I began to write this poem uh, that I finally understood what that frustration was due to. This is meeting Roscoe Latham after Farmer Roscoe, Ivan Olinsky, Oil and Canvas, circa 1937. A brace of blinkered horses stands behind him in the furrows of their unfinished toil, their traces slack despite a yellow cast of coming rain. Their sculpted beauty is arresting, and their serenity alone would draw me, were they the focus of the work. But in the foreground, a man is speaking in denim overalls and homespun shirt, buttoned at the collar against the dust and chaff. His beard is orderly and full, sufficient to protect him from the wind and sun of working seasons. But the posture of the farmer is what has kept me here. His head is slightly tilted, and he holds one palm against the other as, a patient, as the patient teacher might surrounded in an ancient square. His eyes are urging me to stay. They tell me I have come upon a slow unnodding and a fragile understanding whose sharing cannot wait. I imagine him throughout his day, lost in thought and labor, gathering, winnowing what he is ready now to tell me. I smell the loam his plowing stirred and feel the grit along the creases of his neck but though I lean toward him reflexively, the only voice I hear is mine. Listen where you can. How often have I come upon him, looked away and hurried past, 
toward what bits of light might he have led me. Within the quiet recess where my smaller sorrows go, today there lies another for the passing of a farmer into silence and the amber light of an artist's palette. Um, I will end with a shadow orchard. I'll say a couple of things about this afterwards very briefly. Shadow orchard. This is where the orchard would have been, sloping from the lichen dappled boulders to its north, warming in the slant of morning sun that would have filled this patch of land if I had cleared it. I thought I'd keep a dozen apples, a pair of quinces for the calm that quaintness brings me, and a couple seckle pears, such as those I climbed along the sandy driveway of my childhood. By now, the trees would have been bearing fruit for decades, and I would have a chair or two within them where I could catch the sun or shade as I preferred, while sitting with my coffee and the morning's reading. In my later years, I would have been a slow sentry, pausing at each tree, twirling silken tents around a stick and dropping pests into a soapy bucket. With so few trees, my vigilance may have been enough. Even to myself at times, I would have made excuses for wandering the hundred feet or so just to be among them, to sit and follow bees, honeyed sparks against the sun, rising from the cups of pale blossoms. And when I'd passed, from time to time, my family may have gathered in the fragrance of the gnarled branches and thought of me and spoken of how deeply I had loved this place of peace. The only thing I'd like to say about that before I leave you is that uh, we've probably all uh, been part of a conversation at some time about whether or not poetry actually makes a difference in society as it is today. And I, I'm, I'm, I believe that it does. I believe it's incremental. I believe if it got a lot more attention, it would be less incremental, but, but it's there. But one thing I know for certain is that poetry changes the poet. Uh, when I finished this poem, I planted three apple trees. And um, I really don't think that would have happened otherwise. Thank you all very much. Wonderful. Oh, ooh, that was wonderful. Your your poems about nature are just luminous. I really, I really love your work. Um, by the way, I often write down lines um of poems that really grabbed me. I, I realized I should do a, a cento poem someday, <laughs> steal lines from all your poems. From you, Lou, I will steal. I know we must be form, but I feel we could be light. And also the beauty of a greenlit world that waits outside myself. Just beautiful. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you so much. Um, wow. Okay, so next we have, um, hold on, let me pull up my, my file here. D. Walsh Gilbert, better known for most of us as Debbie, um, is co-editor of the Connecticut River Review. Uh, her six poetry collections include Finches in Kilmainham. I'm, you're going to have to pronounce that if you would, please, Debbie. Um, and Ransom, both Grayson Books, um, Mary from Kelsey Books, and Deirdre from Impspired. So um, please correct my pronunciation and, and welcome uh, Debbie Gilbert. Thank you, Barb, and thank you, Lucy, and all of Ridgefield Library. I'm so happy that um, with all of you have come tonight. Uh, for the past uh, couple of years, I've been writing um, all about my Irish ancestry, and I've just finished a story in verse called Finches in Kilmainham. And as Barb said, it was uh, published by Grayson Books. That's what I'm going to read from tonight. It's about a nine-year-old girl who is imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail in Dublin, Ireland around 1850, around the time of the Irish famine. And it's all fictional, but her story is based on real, very sad events. And even though it's historical, it does feel very relevant considering what's going on in our world today. 
Um, the girl's name is Anne Gallagher. Um, she's nicknamed Dill. And she's basically jailed for being a homeless orphan. That's all. I'm going to read a few poems just to kind of introduce you to the story. Um, the first is about the Irish famine itself. And the famine was also called the Great Hunger. So this poem is called The Great Hunger. On Gorta Moor. And another mother lowers her dead infant into a pit dug in the middle of the night so her neighbors won't be aware. Hail Mary, as she falls to her knees, pray for us sinners. Now and at the hour of our death, amen. Her bare feet split at the heel with scuffs and cracks and blisters, mud-covered ragged toenails, black toes, festers, the wounds at the ankles. Men, women, children, together, but alone. Calluses, boils, and rot to the marrow, forced into hovel, into holes in the bog. Forced to eat nettle, limpet, seaweed, and grass. Bury the dead without coffins, and then try to catch the rats and the dog. Look at the souls, the black fever, road fever, when families lay down together as one and succumb. Some only stare at the tattered cups. Some turn from the hair, from the teeth. Some close their eyes, some walk away. Some are awake to the open ground graves. Some hear the prayers and say nothing. Some will bring soup, some stir about porridge. Starvation on old meat and cheap corn. And skeletons continue to sharpen. The specters and demons will speak from the graves, tattered and praying, sour, ugly, and bleeding. But the chaffinch in the hedge will keep singing, its feet holding fast to what's green. And the next is Anne Gallagher, also known as Bill. She's the delicacy of the lace of Carrick Macross with petty point freckles on a complexion of milk, mink brown curls, spindled and tatted, the floss of a lamb in April. She's string bean legs and buttery skin, the smile of a candle at sundown. She's the tan linen tablecloth left on the clothesline a canvas the pins can't hold still, the chatter of magpie, an eavesdropping mouse, the teeter of a three-legged fox. She's turf fire, warming winter's clear rhinestone light. And she's nicknamed Dill, a spicy wheat, an annual thought to be short lasting. She's the nestling abandoned in its manger straw while the cat is climbing the limb. The Garda call her the spot on the cloth left after Sunday's tea, the thumbprint, the sin, which can't be removed no matter the soap, the scrubbing, the rinse, Yet the more it's washed, the more it softens. And she's the heirloom thread. The fiber, the flax, left in the field 
to return. Perennial, she's the gentle blue flower who wouldn't be killed, who stayed and scattered in mid-century wind until its seeds could land on rot overturned earth and field stones heard the seeds taking root. Well, Dill becomes a homeless orphan and she lands in Kilmainham jail, which is a bit more like a dungeon than a jail. Um, it's very, very creepy. The doorway alone has a transom with five snakes above it, and it's all meant to be a warning. The next poem is Into Kilmainham's West Wing. Like the writhing serpents of hell itself, Five stone heads on five slithering bodies twist together and transom the entry. Five fearsome eyes, the pointed wings of dragons, tongues and scaled skin, teeth filed and able to rip, all collared and chained into tangles all spiral like a triskeel. Here, life, death, and rebirth in a wicked harmony. Incarceration is a new existence for the peasant, poor and hungry. This doorway greets the prisoner, the felon, the debtor, the woman, the child, a thief, of parsnip and train fare. Once the black iron gates are unbolted and opened, the darkness is broken only by a sick green gaslight. Then there's limestone and granite, brick and thick walls and a long narrow corridor girdered in rows of Victorian gingerbread, scrolled brackets, curled iron, almost beautiful, like vines or the waves of the sea. Are these the arabesque of turnabout and resurrection? This is Gallows Hill. This is Kilmainham Jail with one candle for each cell and buckets of cold piss to slop out each morning. Here on dirt and stone slabs, the prayers of the condemned, murderer, rapist, traitor. What's heard? A man crying for his mother, the footsteps of his jailer, an iron bolt as it slides through the jam, the squeak of a rat and the scratch after lice and the fleas where a baby awakes on the floor. The inmates hear the jangle of keys, the jangle of those carved serpents' chains and the death bell which rings when the hanged Bodies fall, executions in full public view. So that's the horrors of Kilmainham Jail and little nine-year-old Dill was put in there. After a while though, in her cell, Dill starts to recall how good life had been before all this started. And the lines quoted here, I'll go like this, um, are from the poem, The One, um, which is by the great Irish poet, Patrick Kavanaugh. The poem is called Remembering. There's a rhythm 
a repetition, almost a song. Dill hears a lone cricket hidden in the shadows. Eyes closed, it reminds her of home, of before, four years ago. Chicken tucked under her arm as she walked the hill to her cottage, a single room buyer, one farm in the clocken. She could smell Millie the cow come in for winter, remembers how her father jailed it in the lower end if it cozied too close to the hearth and the chimney or disturbed the hard clay floor with its hoof before their evening dancing. A humble scene in a backward place where no one important ever looked. That beautiful, beautiful, beautiful God was breathing his love by a cutaway bog. Her father meant to add a loft one day, to raise the roof, replace the thatch, secure it with a rope net and stone ballast, then latch the half door to lean against and smoke his pipe and gossip. But the potatoes failed and the landlord's taxes grew too plentiful and the whitewash was scoured off the wattle and daub by fever and loss. Then the fire went out and the people went out, all gathered on low walls and turf mounds and the eggless chickens pecked at the dirt endeavoring until they were eaten. So this is the last poem. I'll leave you with a little happier excerpt. <laughs> um, it's an excerpt from a longer poem and it's, uh, it's actually a spell that's told to Dill by a pagan woman who also happens to be a pirate in the story. Um, remember that Dill's real name is Anne, Anne Gallagher. Um, and here she's turned into Anya. Um, Anya is the goddess of love. Um, she's the goddess of the summer sun and of power. So Dill connects and she becomes old Irish. Gather bee balm and angelica, cowslip, mugwort, elder, goat's rue, nettle, fennel, flax. It all belongs to you. A bit of middle, mistletoe and bladder rack, sweet lavender's protection. When you leave this prison cell, breathe deeply, once, thrice, many times. Let the sun rays warm you. Sink into your skin, Anne Gallagher. Draw its heat into your heart, the middle cauldron of your motion. See its ball of fire. Fill your body with its light. Look into Anya's eyes. Then back out through your own. What can never be taken away. Invoke your true name. Say it. Anya. Thank you. Wonderful, Debbie. Wow. You have an incredible imagination. You could, I mean, it's interesting when, when with these narrative poems, um, they really could become novelized too. So thank yeah. you for sharing that. Great story. I have a friend named Ann Gallagher. I'm going to have to get her a copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for listening. Oh, well, thank you very, very much. Um, okay. Uh, by the way, happy National Poetry Month, everyone. I forgot to mention that right out of the gate, but uh, 
hopefully you're having lots of poetry events this this month, um, either attending them or hosting them or just, um, I don't know if anyone's doing the poem a day challenge and um, nay pomo challenge. Um, I got to day two and said, you know what? <laughs> I don't think so, not this year. But uh, anyway, welcome. Uh, next up, we have Robert Cording. Uh, and again, uh, I will right now post his full length biography in the chat. Um, Bob has published 10 collections of poems, the most recent of which is In the Unwalled City, um, published by Slant in 2022. He is the recipient of two NEA fellowships and has won two Pushcart Prizes in poetry. So please welcome Robert Cording. Hi, Bob. Hi, thank you. I'm going to read from uh, a few poems from In the Wall, Unwalled City, but basically what I'm going to do is read poems about Woodstock, uh, where I've lived for the last 38 years, and uh, it's it's really been a home to me and, and my family. So these are all poems that take place outside my house. The first come from uh, the book that you mentioned, In the Unwalled City, and that's a book that's in prose and poetry, and it's about uh, my son who died when he was 31, uh, quite suddenly. This is called Icarus. After our son died, my wife found him in coincidences, sightings of hawks mostly, at the oddest of times and places, and then in a pair of red tails that took up residence, nesting in a larch above our barn, and have their low frequent sweeps just a few feet above us before rising over our kitchen roof made it seem as if they were looking in on us. In a way, it all made sense. Our son, so at home in high places, the edges of mountain trails, walking on a roof, or later after he became a house painter at the top of a 40-foot ladder. So many mornings we woke to the red tails jolting screeches, and even if I was a casual believer, their presence multiplied my love for the ordinary more every day. We never thought, of course, any of those hawks was our son. Who would ever want that? But once, watching one rise and rise on a draft of air, I thought of Icarus zoring towards the sun as if an old story could provide the distance I needed. Waxed and feathered, his arms winged, I remembered a babysitter's frantic call to come home immediately after she'd found our 10-year-old son nearly 40 feet up in an oak tree. I can almost hear him laughing high in the sky, throned on a branch, his feet dangling, knowing nothing but the promise of heights as he waved to me. And I must have looked very small calling up to him, staying calm so falsely as I pleaded with him to come down, to come down now. This next one is uh, called Bobcat. Uh, it's a true story. Uh, it, will, it will explain itself, Bobcat. It came and went like a revelation and yet was only a Bobcat. And not the first I'd seen cross the narrow field behind my house to hunt for rabbits. But this one just stood there in full daylight, as if it wanted to be seen. The sun turning its tan coat gold, the bright October leaves falling around it, or turning alertly in a breeze against a background of cloudless blue sky. From a window, I took the bobcat in with binoculars its tan coat slatted with black bars, its erect black-tipped ears, the off-white fur around its lips and chin, and those yellow eyes with black pupils that seemed to watch me as I watched, freed for those two or three minutes from the need to understand. I didn't ask how the bobcat had come to be where I was, and I to where I was, this first day of my son's sudden death. It was October 14th, and though I wanted to make the bobcat what it was not, some type of offering or sign, I simply watched it come and go, though its strangeness has stayed with me. A bobcat, 
incapable of sadness, and which had no meaning, or none I could grasp, stepped into the open and stood in leaf fall an afternoon's gold. Not what I would have asked for, but all that was there, at home, in the day's passing light. This is a, like Lou, I'm a bird feeder, <laughs> bird feeder guy. Uh, this is called St. Francis of the Bird Feeder. Time is dawdled away. Nothing I had planned to do has gotten done. And here I am standing at the window again, the dim winter light and gray stone of sky dulling the white of fallen snow. Birds wing back and forth to the feeders I've hung from a metal pole with arms. Chickadees, titmice, nuthatches, downy woodpeckers. And I'm looking into that circle of fluttering birds when the disk of faintly glowing sun behind the pole reminds me of the halo around St. Francis' head in Giotto's painting of him preaching to the birds. Love holding them in a wheel of flight around him or lining them up on the ground like these juncos pecking for fallen seed. And when I take it all a step further, wondering if St. Francis could show these poor birds the kingdom, my dead son's voice breaks in, perfectly clear, and exactly as I remember it, mocking my need to turn a metal pole into St. Francis. He's gotten a laugh out of me, enlightened, if only a bit, the weight of the day. Even if I've already turned back to the pole, where a pair of cardinals rest on St. Francis's arm, and I wait, hoping to hear his voice again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a poem about working in my yard with my wife. We live uh, in, an, in an old, well, it was once a, a 1790 farm. It's been reduced uh, quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, it's shrunk into, it's probably about three or 400 acres now, it's about eight. Clearing brush. We're out here again, clearing the stone walls of this shrunken 18th century farm, buried in a green tangle of grapevines, fallen trees, spirea and nettles, and those tough to kill plumes of life rising again from one year old stumps. I run the brush saw, you a weed whacker, gloved hands, deer flies, briar and poison ivy. Always our dead sun in our minds as we lop, cut and pile the brush all summer. Each October when the day of his death arrives, we burn the mound we've built. The shadows get longer, the sun slipping lower in the sky as we rip out the roots of a Ragosa rose. This we have some control over at least temporarily. The lean of grief, paid down by the sweat of our work, exhaustion our goal, and pleasure. This end of day standing together in the softened late gold light. We look down a length of cleared wall, full, fallen stones dug out, restacked, and visible again as if the past we'd begun to lose sight of over time had been uncovered once more. I'm gonna read one more. Uh, this is a poem called Hydrangea, which is, there's a big hydrangea. I mean, it's a, it's circumference is probably uh, 20 feet around, <laughs> you know, it's been there. It's an old house. It's been there a long time. Hydrangea. My burning bush spoke in the hum of bees that day, the hydrangea, a commonwealth of blooms. After a night's rain, cones of new flowers, the water wells of its name shivered with sunlight. The bush could have been the center around which everything hummed, was dependent on that hum. The rain, the sun, the flowers, the bees, each existing for the other and for me, 
who had been trying for so long to transform my grief into what was there, precisely, just then. The raindrops tippled with light, magnifying the spring sun, and the branches bent with bloom, and those hundreds and hundreds of transubstantiating bees that worked each white cone of the hydrangea until I felt the bush become a circle with many centers, but no circumference. Thank you. Just gorgeous, really gorgeous poems. Now, um, Bob, are the poems that you read this evening primarily from In the Unwalled City? Yes, yeah, and, and the last uh, two are from, a, I have a new and selected poems coming out in 20, it will be 2025 or 2026 from Slant again. Oh, excellent, excellent. It's called uh, What's Possible, What's New possible? and Selected Poems. Excellent. Um, it's so true how when you lose someone dear to you, you really look for signs, you look for, for um, their reappearance in so many different forms. So I love that your son mocked you at one point. <laughs> uh, he, was, uh, he was my Shakespearean fool. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Really, really moving poems. Okay, so our last poem for this evening. Um, hold on, let me just put in her biography here. Um, Joan Hoffman is Poet Laureate Emerita of Canton. Uh, her poems are widely published and include three chapbooks, Coming Back, Coming Back Alive, oh, I'm sorry, Coming Back, sorry, Alive and Alive Too, T-O-O. -O. Uh, retired educator, she's an avid traveler, uh, gardener and hiker. So please welcome Joan Hoffman. Hi, Joan. Oh, you need to unmute, Joan? Thank you, sorry. There, there you go. That's it, yep, you got okay. it. <laughs> Hi, I'm very pleased to be with you tonight, and I'm glad that I figured out where the unmute button is. <laughs> We are too. <laughs> it's always good. Um, I have just a few poems for you. And like Bob, I've selected ones that are related to um, my home life. I live in Canton, as um, as was just said. And I live in the village of Collinsville. Been here for 40 years along the Farmington River, a favorite spot for me. So I have an outset poem first, though, four lines. And this is written for a friend of mine that came to mind yesterday when I was driving back from Boston. He lives in Massachusetts. Last summer, he was coming back from Idaho from a canoeing trip and came down with COVID. Well, that's not all of the story. Here we are 10 months later and he has long COVID. So I wrote a mantra for him. It's called Mantra for David. Today, I walked because I could. Because I could, I walked. That's all. I could, so I did. I walked today. So I wish with you, if you would join me in whatever form of prayer, or intention, meditation, that we send him healing thoughts. My poem today, uh, my first poem is from... Um, this that was mentioned earlier, Waking Up to the Earth, a poem called The Takedown. I've lived in my house here in Collinsville for over 40 years. Love it on the hillside here of the Farmington River. However, a couple of years ago, there was a change in regulations made by planning and zoning and an empty lot across the street with my whole canopy <laughs> coming down the hillside over me it was deemed a buildable lot. And a developer took that over. So I wrote this poem on that day called The Takedown. I watched giants felled one after another and another, and the clearing took hours. For hours, I watched in horror 
and efficiency of decimation. In a single day, the lot next to me transformed from an assurance of green frilled broad canopy sustained by 60 foot high trunks, a beauty of curved barked stalks into a cleared space. The maple's now gone, and until now, unseen interior is exposed. Is this awkward gawking addictive or just instinct inherited? Stunned, I'm both curious and crestfallen. I'm not the only one disoriented. Like fingernails of dirt, some things you just can't forget. The choo-choo-choo of the cardinal, the silhouette of the maples at daybreak, the mating pileated woodpeckers, the hoot 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 of the lone owl, the bone chill noise of the chainsaw, the split crack and thud of the drops, the story's high pile of brush, brush, such a light word for huge limbs that shook earth today. The scream ring of the chipper grinding. Everyone's nest has been upended. In the silence of emptiness, under spareness of a too blue sky, a scatter of sparrows arrives. One bird after another to make a necklace on top of the new chain link fence. Each stands facing the same direction toward the now barren space of the uprooted, the missing. The next poem that I'll read for you is from Alive Too. It's a long poem. I love living here. I love representing the northwestern part of the state today, Barb. Thank you very much. Um, you know, being on the western side of Calcutt and Avon Mountains and moving over into the Litchfield Hills. It's a lovely, lovely um, valley to be in. And so in these towns of Avon, Simsbury, Farmington and such, we are urban and we are some rural. We are dense and we are lovely. So the poem I'm reading you next is a dear encounter. Why our eyes met two on one. Because I was driving down Bushy Hill Road that Thursday afternoon, early October. Because deer species have elliptical eyes that can move and dilate unlike human pupils. Because days end calls us, me, and you, person and creature, to change scene and proximity. Because you, dear, were crossing Bushy Hill Road that afternoon just before I drove to where you were crossing me. Because it was an otherwise uneventful day in which I was not concerned with matters of life and death or even a sick friend. Because drivers move cars slowly when there's a danger or a scene to be taken in. Because sitting in a car puts you eye to eye level with a deer's head height. Because the population of white-tailed deer in Connecticut continues to increase. Because deer have exquisite night vision with retinas filled with photoreceptors, but it wasn't night yet. Because when deers look into oncoming headlights, they're blinded by the light and don't move. Because I'm a person who has to look, especially when there might be reason to look away. Because the first time I hit a squirrel, it was on a street like Bushy Hill, but in New Jersey, lined the same with a canopy of maples and evergreens on both sides. 
because the officer directing drivers today was maneuvering two direction rush hour traffic. So cars moved silently, like in a caravan following a hearse. Because you were no longer in a hurry to be anywhere else. Because you'd been hit, dear, but not hurt so much that anyone could tell. So you stood in the middle of the road, still parallel with the yellow center lines. Because even if your tall legs could carry you on, there was nowhere to go while bumper to bumper car streams encircled you on both sides, an anomaly of the macadam. Because a mile down the road, a traffic light signaled cars to come to a dead stop every few minutes for a few minutes, stopping the caravan. Because the sound made by the tire hitting the squirrel was a dull thud that shot through the brake pedal to my right foot slammed down hard. Because I have a history of bringing wounded animals to get care and be made well again. Because my brother is a veterinarian and I was sure to tell him that I'd seen you. And he would ask me questions that I would want to answer accurately. Because animals, like deer, transect the maze of roads laid down many times a day. Because waiting in the line of cars, I spotted you in the center of the road, pointed hoops straddling the double yellow lines, your white backside defined, white tail down. Because you, dear, have millions of scent receptors in your nose, inches from your eyes. And though I didn't smell you, I know you smelled me, which made me cautious. Because your antlers were big, maybe fully grown. And as I drove closer to you, they seemed huge and dangerous. Because close looking is something I do especially in the woods. But I'd been told it's best to observe deer from a distance. Because you were spooked as I was, dear, to be in that unexpected spectacle, eerily quiet. Because encounters with deer are laden with fear of hurtful hooves and unpredictability. Because dear, you are wild. And I've been raised to avoid making direct eye contact with wild animals, even one so beautiful as you, certainly one so big. Because you've been life and could swiftly wheel with grace, but now rendered statuesque in tableau. Because your heart must have been bursting I heard mine thumping because you were nocturnal and that night you wouldn't see moonlight through branches, stars from the side of the woods or bed down with kin. Because when I pulled alongside you, I passed your white quivering flank, paralleled your long brown abdomen within reach had I opened the window to stroke you because I didn't stop for the squirrel and luck had me stopped in traffic on your right, dear. We were shoulder to shoulder, facing forward together because your head remained straight down the road between ribbons of cars. No squirrel in sight, your one white rimmed brown eye at arm's reach the other side of the glass from me. Because with my eyes focused toward the windshield, feeling you looming on my left, my peripheral vision begged me to turn my head toward yours. Because when it seems that there might be reason to look away, I'm a person who has to look. Because your large, long-lashed, horizontal, oval eye peered back 
moist and dull dark blank, as though not seeing, reflecting me in a shiny silver camera. Because then I smelled you. Your closeness was staggering. You thrilled me, scared me, filled me with your trauma. Because now, when I drive down Bushy Hill Road, I see you, dear. But I look not towards the center line, but to the woods, as though you'll leap in front of me through the air. And then two shorts for you. A tribute to spring, of course. My gardens are blooming. It's been a, a unique spring for us all. Imagine snowdrops. This poem is called Amen. I wonder at your pale slips shooting up too soon. Meager spikes poke, stalking the icy snow, holding tight to forbidding coldness. How brave you are, scant underlings, to endure the brittle air, to bring your tentative risings above ground for all to see. I like your approach, admire it. Your future insecure, you push on overnight to bear probable failings in full exposure. Despite the bitter frost, your spirit oaths a spring turn for me in depletion to borrow. Take the risk. I cheer you on. Tomorrow, it's my turn. And lastly, a bird song, a bird song poem from a woman who can't get enough of bird song in the morning. So glad the migrants are back. Her tuck. In bed, I hear day's early light through bird song. Wind sung promise translates to my half billowed ear. What, 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 what? Do it, do it, do it. Hey, sweet, sweet, sweet. Hey, sweetie, sweetie, hey. Thank you. I wish I knew how to reply. <laughs> In chickadee, right? Oh, that was, that was, oh, thank you, Joan. And thank you all of our poets this evening. And thank you audience for coming. It's wonderful to see you. Um, I'm gonna repost the links uh, in the chat, uh, in case you want to register for the uh, Poets Laureate reading with Antoinette Brimbell on Youth Poet Laureate Mercury uh, uh, Mercury Lamb, or for our May um, Four Corners reading, and we'd love to have you at both. But Lucy, thank you so much. Thank you, Bridgefield Library. <laughs> the peace sign, and we wish you all a good night. Night. Happy National Poetry Month. You. <laughs> good night. Thank you.